your camera, are you moving, holding it? Yeah, hang on. I know what I can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, that doesn't work. Hang, hang on. Let's see. Oh, no, no, that's the seat. Right, there we go. There we go. No, I'm filming. No, too, right. Right, hang on. For fuck's sake. <laughs> that's too low. <laughs> No, why does my face look like an oblong? It needs to be like there, doesn't it? Right. Oh, bye. Oh. <laughs> right. oh, Emma. There we go. Yes. Right. I wish, you could, I wish you could see this setup right now. I need to basically not move. So I've got three books. And the phone thing ledged on it. That's okay. We're in business. We got this. Welcome everybody to In The Spotlight. And this is round two. Uh, we've, we've actually done this interview before, but we've got to do it again. Uh, it's Emma Louise Jones. Uh, Hi. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. And um, thank you for doing round two because I had my back to you all the time last time. Yeah, practically, we were looking back through the video last time, and because the video wasn't working properly, it looked like Emma was having a conversation with the gardener instead of <laughs> It was far more interesting than you, to be fair. <laughs> to be honest, he's like that one from Desperate Housewives, and I don't blame you. <laughs> Socially distant, though. Oh, you, you didn't move. You were still in shock, so yeah. it's okay. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> How's lockdown? Um... It's, I mean, it's all right. I don't know about you, but I feel like I've lived like five different lives in lockdown. I feel like at first there was the thing where everyone's like, okay, this is totally different and we just stay in. And everyone was kind of like, right, we're going to do Joe Wicks. We're going to watch everything on Netflix. We are going to bake that banana bread. And then the middle bit came and, and, and we're all clapping. Obviously, we've managed to maintain that. And then the middle bit came and everyone's like, okay, don't know when this is going to end. So let's just keep plodding on. Let's get fit. Let's get our 5Ks in. You know, let's keep applauding the NHS. And then I feel like we're getting to this point now and, and everyone's like, we all understand why we've got to do it because health and well-being is first. But um, also, also, I think everyone's like, OK, when am I allowed to leave my house? Like, I live with my dad and brother, my twin brother, um, and they are great company. I absolutely love them. But my God, am I excited just to, like, see another human being and hug another human being. I am so excited, James. Is that the first thing you do when you got out, get out of lockdown? The first thing I'm doing, the moment they say you're allowed, is so I probably won't be able to because my nana is in her 80s. The first thing I would like to do is run there and squeeze her so hard that I feel like I'm breaking the bones. Um, and then I will be handing out hugs to strangers because I miss human contact that much. I wouldn't necessarily suggest the latter too much because you <laughs> Looking at social media, quite a big queue of people. <laughs> the thing is, they're going. <laughs> you say this, James, but once they meet me, they'd be definitely more scared of me than I am of them. So <laughs> you're really close with your nan, aren't you? Oh, she is like my hero. I am. She's the best lady ever. I can't. Even, that's been the hardest bit for me. Is I, me and my brothers go round all the time. We're always at our grandparents' house. And not being able to see her and just having to drop the food by the door and sort of wave from a distance and say, we love you. That has genuinely been the hardest. I can feel myself getting upset just thinking right now. Like, and that sounds ridiculous because people have lost loved ones. So I know that sounds stupid. But because I spent my whole life just going around there all the time, you know, at least four times a week. To take that away is then like, well, it's horrible. That, that's okay to feel like that that's missing human contact and yeah something so important to you um do you think she'll say the same as well just desperate for a cuddle uh she's probably quite happy actually <laughs> no she um to be fair we we facetime them a lot um and we've progressed throughout isolation because when we first set them up with um an ipad and facetime we just had a really good view of the ceiling but now we've got to the point where we can see their foreheads. So we're making improvements. Um, but as she does, she does miss us. She, she says to us on the phone, you know. But they're, they're very resilient, I think, because they've been through, a lot of that generation have been through a lot more. They're, they kind of go, well, this is what we've got to do. So we crack on with it. And I'm not being funny, but they're getting the food delivered. They're all right, aren't they? <laughs> but, 
living living like queen and kings, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, she will. She'll be excited to have a cuddle off us. So, do you think your um, camera skills uh, have been uh, inherited by yourself from your <laughs> grandma? I would agree with that. Yeah, I would agree. I um, am not great on camera. This is one thing that I've learned um, since isolation. So my brother is a personal trainer and he was um, he spent a lot of time working with me on how to do different exercises and get my form correct. And I was like, right, I'm going to make some videos and share it with other people so that they can see how to do the correct form. And he basically went through my videos and pulled them apart. He was like, Emma, your camera angles are terrible. But I've never thought like that. I've never been on that side of the camera getting the angles and stuff. So, you know, I've realised how much I've taken that for granted. But I'm holding, I'm working on it. I'm going to get that. I will nail it before I isolate it up. See, that's a, good, that's a good skill to learn in lockdown. Well, I've learned it here because I've stacked three books up and you can see me. <laughs> Nailed it. I will put. I will have to put that start in. At some, I will have to put it in. It was. Um, it was a good two and a half minutes of pure chaos, and I was looking at either the ceiling or the floor most of the time. So wondering when it was going to end. <laughs> a bit, it's all right. We got there in the end. Uh, it's, it's been a mission, but thank you so much for doing this. Right, Emma, tell me about yourself. You. Um, I know you went to university. So you went to Sheffield Hallam University. Um, how was, and what was University Emma like? Um, University Emma was wild. Um, I absolutely loved it. I had a very good time at uni. Um, I lived my life, probably didn't study anywhere near as much as I should have, but I don't regret that because I, what I would say to a lot of people who are looking to go to uni is get the balance right. Like know that you, you are there to get an education. You pay a lot of money to do it, but have a really good time. You want to come away with great memories and be able to look back and go, do you know what? I, I relished those three years or however long you're there. Um, don't do what I did probably because all, all I did for the three years was eat a lot, drink a lot and have a good time. Um, and then it kind of came to like, some, somehow, I do not know how I got a 2-1. I genuinely have no idea how that happened because I did not invest much into my university experience and I realised I probably shouldn't say that but it is, I'm just being honest um, but what I did do was have an absolute blast it, but it's those memories that you'll never forget right and you also learn your life skills there don't you yeah I mean don't get me wrong for six months of first year I was uh, sticking a jacket potato in a microwave and just mastering the art but I thought I was a top chef just being able to do that because I'd never done it before uh, the first time I did that I put foil around it that was an error um but it and it was just it's just kind of that thing you just it's the first proper time for a lot of people that you're away from home and you've got that freedom and you're meeting new people you're in a different city you realize there's more more world out there than you ever knew before and you just it, I know people are different again but you I just wanted to grasp that and seize it and go, right, let's have a go at everything here. And do, you, do you think you take that uh, advice and that philosophy, so to speak, into your life now that let's just go for it? Yeah, yeah I am a very, uh, I am impulsive and sometimes that's to my detriment, but it also means that I put myself in situations and have very much a, I'm just going to give this a go attitude. And that has, you know, in a lot of ways, it served me well because it's meant that I'm I'm very willing to step outside of my comfort zone and I actually thrive off it a bit. I, I kind of like the idea of not being fully comfortable because then you're going to grow. You're going to get the best experiences, opportunities and memories from stepping outside of that. So definitely, I definitely still have a lot of that in me. I think I'm a bit more disciplined in myself now because I've had no choice but because I've got bills to pay. But um, yeah, I do think... Yeah, that is, it can it can serve you well. You're probably the same, and I think a lot of people within our industry are. You throw yourself into stuff, and it's um, a lot of the time just being thrown in at the deep end is the best way. No time to think, just do it. Yeah, I, I definitely threw myself into the deep end at university. Yes. I, I, I'm sitting there listening to your story again. Yep. Well, did we that. went to the same uni, didn't we? We did. Not at the same time. Um, I'm a lot younger, so I was a bit more recent. But, um... Liar! <laughs> uh. <laughs> what I have realised, though, was that inflation was an issue because you were going out and getting drinks for 60p and I was spending £1.50 on it. Yeah, this is true. This is the side of my age. 60p vodka Red Bull 
Um, wow. That's my story. Leadmill, Leadmill. It was in my first year. We used to go there. I think, I think it used to be maybe a Thursday. Or a I think Tuesday was Leadmill. We literally went somewhere every night, apart from Sunday. Sunday was yeah. date night. Um, you're allowed to date on Sunday. Any other thing. <laughs> Um, and oh, that's nice. One day allocated. One day out of it. All right. Um, if you had any luck. And <laughs> Tuesdays, I was level, and it used to be 60p for a vodka Red Bull. I used to go out of a tenner, be able to have a kebab on the way home, and still have change in my pocket. It was amazing. That is crazy. Can I ask, did you ever um, embrace the big club in the middle of the city? Kingdom. Who? Kingdom. Definitely never been called Kingdom. Um, <laughs> it was in the 80s well I think embrace is far more apt because you just had to embrace it um, is that oh, outside it's there the kingdom. it was the kingdom it was the best I mean it's, it was never a kingdom not in my day anyway but I loved it you used to stick to the floor lose all your mates because you'd go to the toilet and they'd be on another floor you'd stumble out of there get some oh i befriended the guy that lived, that worked in the van outside that served cheesy chips and i used to say to him bit of extra cheese on top please mate he would mound that cheese on and do you know what one of my biggest expenses was at uni having to pay to replace my mobile phone because at the end of the night i'd be in the taxi I'd have a phone in one hand, cheesy chips in another, and when I'd open the door, the cheesy chips took priority. So my phone would always end up on the floor or lost or something. But let me tell you, the cheesy chips were worth it. <laughs> Do you look after your phone a bit better nowadays? No, not really. You've seen me trying to set it up on here. <laughs> I'm terrible. It's had a few. It's had a few drops already today. Too. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyway, right, you got a two-one. So that's no mean feat uh, in, in journalism. So at that point in your life, did you know what you wanted to do? Um, I always knew growing up. Um, I've always been interested in people. I've always liked to chat. I don't know if you've noticed. Um, and I'm I'm fascinated. By... <laughs> you never know, would you? I'm fascinated by. You're a bit people. quiet. For my life. <laughs> I've often been called a wallflower, um, but I just, I like people, I like talking to people, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by different people's backgrounds and what makes us, and I knew that in, in high school that I wanted to do something that involved me being able to get to know people and learn about them, and I remember being in English and my teacher saying, Emma Jones, if you spend as much time doing your work as you do talking to other people, then you might actually get somewhere. And I was like, all right. Um, but so I knew, you know, I also have the concentration concentration span of a gnat. So I, I could never do something that required me to sit down in an office for an extended period. It was going to have to be something where I was on the ball, up and at it, going. Um, so I knew. And, and I also, I, I enjoy writing. So for a long period, I thought, you know, journalism would be a great thing to be able to do, interview people, write about it. But then as I got older and built my confidence and realised just how much I enjoyed engaging with people, I think that was where I was like, oh, I'd like to do the broadcast side of it. So you you had that focus, you finished university, you were, in your own words, and maybe a little bit disappointed that you didn't study as much. Yeah. But you thought, well, I'm going to make up for that. And not many people do this, but you were like, right, OK, I'm going to do a master's. Yeah, absolutely. That decision. Um. So I came out of uni, and I'm sure a lot of people have had it. You might have had it, like the post-uni blues, where you kind of go, it's... Back to, back to your mum and dad. Going... Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's this four months of going, who am I and where is this bubble I've been living in that I loved so much? Um, and so I was like, I think I had, and I think it's okay to have a period of going, oh, I feel a bit down about it all. But then I, like, grabbed myself and was like, well, if you feel down, you've got to sort it. And I... Um, I thought, yeah, do you know, in fact, in the last semester at uni, they put me in a radio studio and I kind of came alive there. I was like, wow, I love this. So that day at uni, that was the most proactive I was work-wise. I got on the phone to hospital radio. I said, please can I come and volunteer? I just want to do, be on the radio. I want to do something with it. Um, and they, they said, you know, when you finish your degree, you're welcome to come in and have a look around. And so... I, yeah, I left uni, I was like, right, I know I want to get into broadcast journalism, had a look at the masters, I saw that, you know, 
it was I wasn't going to get accepted just because I had a degree. So I went into hospital radio. I did the Saturday morning show on local hospital radio. Called myself DJ EJ. Um, and, <laughs> James, let me tell you, my friends have never let me live that down to this day. There's a mug sitting in my cupboard that says, "Yeah, that's right, it's me, DJ EJ." <laughs> So on a Saturday morning, can I just apologise to any patients that may have heard me saying, morning patients, DJ EJ here. <laughs> and um, there was a great guy who welcomed me with open arms and he used to make jingles for me and put my shows on a CD. And I still have that CD and I listen back now and I'm like, oh, that was tragic. Um, I, went, I, I went and worked at uh, the local newspaper, did work experience there. I did uh, community radio. I went to, I worked in a call centre because I obviously needed to make money as well at the time. So I basically was trying to put myself everywhere and do everything. Um, and yeah, I got accepted on to the Masters, two year Masters. And genuinely, that was, I had to be more disciplined then. I was like, I'm not living on campus because old Emma will come back. Um, so I lived at home, commuted. And that was where I did really sort of, you know, invest the time into it. And was it tough to do that? Was it tough to focus? Or were you just like, you knew at this point, right, I've got an end goal in mind. I'm just going to knuckle down. I'm going to shut out any outside influence. And I'm just going to dedicate this two years to this. Yeah. It, I think the, the toughest part was that all my friends had either not done uni or done uni and finished and they were all cracking on with work. But because I knew, I, I, I knew it was the long game. And I was like, in two years time, this is going to be done. And I'm going to have so much more experience and feel in a much better position. It's like short term pain for long term gain that I knew I had to do this to get the job that I wanted. So it was worth it. Um, it did teach me how to have a bit of self-control. It re genuinely did. I was like, Emma, you, you cannot go out every single. I mean, I could have done, but I didn't. I, was, I, I learned how to how to manage, how to get that balance that I wish I'd. I probably should have had the first time round, and as part of the masters, uh, we were requi required to do work experience, and again, that was beneficial because it put me. I went over to Channel Five News in London. I went over to Key One Hundred and Three in Manchester, so it put me in places where I was able to see people who've really worked hard, and then I gained this understanding that this stuff isn't just going to come to you, and that you're going to have to work hard for it in exactly the same way these people have, and. That was, I think I matured quite a bit, as much as I, I could at that point. Are you sure? No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> you you, you travelled around, uh, which is good, which is all about gaining experience and working in new, uh, new cities, London, as you said, Manchester, radio and TV. W what do you prefer, radio or TV? Oh, it's so tough, that, because... So I'm a bit of a radio geek in that I find it such a special platform. I think you can engage with a listener one-on-one -on -one via radio in a way not possible on anything else. And I found that I have found so much comfort in lockdown through the radio. I've put it on and I've listened and genuinely felt less alone because it's like there's a voice there. And the beauty of it is I know we know what they look like um, these days because of social media and stuff, but they could be anyone but you, it's all in your mind and, and it's just it's that comfort of having a friend what I love about tv is literally anything can happen like and it's so quick and fast and you're thrown into a situation and you've got to roll with it and it's very good fun I think tv is really good fun you're always there's a very much it's a collective team effort I think in tv and you get to know a lot of very good people yeah and I think with tv as well it's uh it's, it's sink or swim. It's you know you're. It's not just your voice. It's your yeah. expressions. It's your hands. It's your clothes. It's everything's there, and it's yeah. like, it just needs to work. But sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Um, and I know you know sometimes it doesn't work like that. Uh, take me to uh, Leeds United TV, and tell us a story, a certain story. We had a little bit of a malfunction or an issue. Oh. Like fun. So this is my first season at LUTV. So bear in mind, I'm still quite, I'm relatively new. And I'm sat in the studio um, above the South Sands with Bobby Davison. And we've gone on air and the director's saying in my ear, Emma, we can't hear you. 
you're going to have to turn your own mic pack up. Um, so I quickly throw to a VT, um, but it was a very short VT. I didn't have long. Didn't have a chance to explain to Bobby what was going on. Jumped up off my stool, ran over to the corner. Bear in mind, it's just a, it's just a box that we're in. So there's nowhere to hide. I had to whip my dress up or skirt, whatever. I was like, whip it up. I just my microphone and I looked up and I just remember Bobby being bright red, like wondering what the hell was going on. But I didn't have time to say anything. I just had to whip myself up, sort myself out, run over to the stool, sit back down and come off the back of the VT. <laughs> and it was at the end. And I was like, I said, Bobby, I'm so sorry. I said, they couldn't hear me. They couldn't hear my mic. But I, bear in mind, like, I hadn't worked with Bobby. He's the loveliest guy. I hadn't worked with him that much. Um, so it was just kind of this. But in that situation, again, it's that whole thing called swim thing. It's kind of like, We've all been in those situations. And I guarantee I'll be in that situation and worse many more times. But you just got to roll with it and laugh at it. And he laughed at it afterwards. And, and you know, we I, get, I love Bobby to bits. He's a great guy. So, fortunately, he wasn't too offended. <laughs> but it was, uh, I definitely left work that day and went, wow, that could have gone better. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Bobby D. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing absolutely amazing i'm sure he didn't mind too much uh no he definitely did <laughs> <laughs> no do you know what i've always made sure and to be fair i think after that the director's always made sure that we test it over and over and over again now before we go live so that i never have to flash in front of a pundit again <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next question. <laughs> I'm just bitching. I'm just bitching his face going. You know, you just don't know where to look and you're like... <laughs> well, because as well, because it's just not been explained to him. All he's seen is the girl he's working with running into the corner of the room, whipping her dress up and then running back over again. <laughs> we live and we learn, James. We live and we learn. But you're still working there, so it wasn't that bad. Exactly. You know, <laughs> I didn't get a disciplinary. <laughs> How was uh, like your first time interviewing footballers? How did you find that? Um, fine. I'm not. Um, I mean, to be fair, I think the, the most nervous I was when I started working at Leeds was when I first interviewed Eddie Gray, because you know the guy's a legend, and you hope that they're going to be as lovely as you hope they're going to be. Um, but you never know, do you? And as you'll know, until you start speaking to him. And I just remember within like me saying one sentence, he, he came over, he greeted me. He was so lovely. And with, he, within one sentence, you know, he just made me feel so at ease at home and so warm. And then I worked with him on um, sort of post-match for a lot of games. And he is the loveliest man. He comes into LUTV now and I've always got a Kit Kat chunky in my mouth when he turns up and he always goes, Eating again, are we, Emma? And it's like, wow. Even now, I still go, Eddie Gray talks to me. Like, you know, that's just mental. But with players themselves, I didn't have that level of nervousness at all. I think it was just because, they're, again, you'll know this, they're, they're, they're tra the media trained and they're, they're nice lads. So they're just going to chat to you. You ask them a few questions and they're going to talk about the game. It's obviously more difficult if the game hasn't gone well, but they... they they're good lads, aren't they? The overwhelming majority. So they'll just talk to you and um, treat you like a any other human being. And and so that I learned very quickly um, that I was going to be safe and happy in that. That's good. And and you thrived in that environment. You're still there. You're still doing it. You progressed on so much more as well. Um, now I want to take you back to the summer of 2018. And you know what's coming because we spoke about it before, but. It, it's a really big, it was a big moment for you um, for maybe different purposes and different reasons. Um, yeah. England, Costa Rica, warm up games to the World Cup. And it was, quite frankly, one of the most boring games of football you ever seen. <laughs> um, and you can vouch for that because you were caught looking quite bored in the picture. But all of a sudden, at the end of the game, there is this picture of you. You're sat behind a dugout and social media just blew up. And it was, who is this girl? Uh, how did that make you feel when you realised that all of a sudden you'd gone viral? Um, it was weird because I was there. I was at Ellen Road working for the FA. So I was absolutely buzzing because I was like, wow, I'm getting to work at 
this game, you know, an international friendly. This is crazy. And I was so excited. I'd met the guys at the FA. They taught me through it all. I'd gone there. I'd been sat. I'd had to sit behind the dugout so I could jump out at half time to do an interview. And um, in at Ellen Road, when it's filled to capacity, you, you don't get any signal. So I had no idea. And so the end of the game came. We'd wrapped up. I was buzzing. I skipped out. I got to my car. I looked at my phone and it had just gone mental. And my friends were sending me photos of me on the TV because I obviously I was sat behind the dugout so you could see me on TV. And I was like, what has gone on? Um, and it was weird. It was just weird. That's how I would describe it because there was such a high for me of uh, career wise. I've been able to do this like for the FA. Like I was. And then it was kind of like I was dugout girl then, you know, <laughs> he's the girl in the dugout. And I was like, oh, and I um, you offended? Yeah, pardon? Were you offended by that? No, no, I'm not. An e- I don't know if you've noticed, I'm not easily offended because my mindset on most things is give it a day and it's old news. So it really doesn't matter. But um, there was... Um, a, a reporter actually I was living at my dad's at the time and a reporter came to my dad's door uh, and he was just on his lunch and he was coming home with a pork pie in his hand and he's greeted at the door by a reporter saying I'm here to take some photos of your daughter and have an interview and my brother was like my brother answered the door and said no you're not that's not happening um and I, that didn't sit comfortably with me because I'm okay with dealing with stuff but I don't think that stuff should fit the idea of a stranger coming to the door and saying to my dad and brother, I'm here to take photos and do an interview with Emma. But I didn't like that. I didn't like that for my family. They, they weren't bothered because they're, as long as I'm OK, they're OK. But I didn't like that. And how are they feeling now, two years on from that? You've actually got so much bigger, but for the right reasons, because of your work and doing some amazing work right now. How, how do they find like your, th- this focus of attention towards you? Um, to be, they're, they're fine with it I think my family's attitude has always been as long as I'm happy they're happy and um, I am generally uh, overwhelmingly happy so I think they just kind of if I have any problems I'm also very open so I tell my dad I tell my brother I tell anybody really you know this is how I'm feeling or I'm not happy about this but their their attitude is you know they, they, they tell me they're proud of me so I'm happy with that but they're proud of the person I am and what I've achieved and, and they're happy that I'm happy. And I think you can't ask them much more than that. No, absolutely. I think it's great. And I think, yeah, hearing anything like that from family, friends, the people you you know love the most, I think that's all that matters. And then, you know, yeah. you're going in the right direction and you're taking the right career path and making the right decisions as well. Yeah, hopefully. Hmm. Um, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> uh, from that moment though, your social media grew rapidly uh what was that like dealing with attention daily and you still are getting attention daily whether on instagram or twitter how do you cope with that the good side and the bad side and i think you can't focus too much on either i'm very much um i i live in the real world i i um the opinions of the people that know me mean a lot to me the opinions of people that don't I, whether they're, they're positive or negative, I accept that they don't know me. So they could think that I'm a wonderful person and I might not be, or they could think I'm a horrible person and I might not be. Um, but I think as with everything in this world right now, um, you, you have to take the good with the bad. And I am, I'm, I'm sensitive to other people's feelings and I'm a sensitive person. But when it comes to social media, um, I am able to almost mentally... Um, put it in a box and go you don't need this you don't you, you don't need to listen to this you don't have to read into this it's not a reflection on you and I know I'm a good person and that kind of that's so that makes me quite able to deal with that if that makes sense is that good for your mental health as well would you give that advice to others who maybe are just getting into that into this yeah. kind of work and then maybe they're dealing with that attention they're getting on social media uh, definitely and don't get me wrong I'm not condoning trolling or anything like that I think that you know anybody who sits on a keyboard and says negative things about people should really assess themselves and, and have a look at themselves because I don't think it's I, I don't think it's fair and I don't think it's nice but unfortunately 
it's uh, it's the nature of the beast. It's what happens on social media. And if you're going to be a, if you're going to be on social media, you are going to get the rough and the smooth. And anyone coming through uh, that's just you know those first few comments. Don't get me wrong, they're going to hurt if you're not used to it. But, but take comfort in the fact that everybody has at some point had to deal with that. And these people do not know you. And there there can be um just they can there can be a lack of understanding there can be ignorance there can be jealousy there can be a whole host of reasons but remember it's not about you it's about them it's about the person that's typing those things it's about the person that's saying them and you could be anybody now talking about anybody um fast forward to right now i love that word fast forward uh you're on radio five live doing their biggest football phoning show with robbie savage and you're getting calls from Absolutely anybody, some of the most random callers ever that I've listened to that have phoned you up as well. Uh, what memorable callers stick in your mind? Uh, we have a lot. Do you know what? I love that show for it. Can I just clarify that that is what makes the show? It is so much fun because you never know who's coming through and what they're going to say. I remember one of my first shows because I've only started in like August last year and uh, a guy rang and was like, yeah, I'm a Leeds fan and uh, I think Potch should be manager, not Bielsa. And I was like, who's paid this guy? Who has paid this guy to ring 606 and say this? Um, I think we had uh, we had an Arsenal fan on, a very optimistic Arsenal fan, uh, who said they were going to win. They were going to win the title. Um, so that was... I- I'm all for a I, bit of optimism. I heard that and I was embarrassed. I was... <laughs> I really was, and he needed to check himself in some. <laughs> but you know what? It's people like him genuinely that made that show. It is so much fun, and we get characters that will call back again at a later date, and it's like, oh, I remember you, and I really liked you, and you are, you're very entertaining. And that show, it's so reactive, because obviously we're on straight after the Sunday football. That and, and, and the beauty of it is these people are just genuinely saying what they think. It's like an open space. Come on, tell us what you think. And Robbie will say whether he agrees or disagrees with you. And, you know, wind him up a bit if you want, because that makes, that makes my job fun, you know. What's so, it like working with Robbie Savage? Uh, it's absolutely wonderful till he opens his mouth. Um, no, I'm joking, <laughs> I'm joking. Do you know what? He is. Um, <laughs> when, when you put us two in a room together, I would describe it as um, an argumentative brother and sister. Um, but I love him. So it's that kind of, I can't help but love the guy. He is so much fun. And he he makes, he is one of the things that makes that show so much fun. Um, he is, he's a pin, he has an opinion and fair play to him. Uh, he, he sticks to his opinion and he, he decides on it and he sticks to it. But I, I have, a, I have a great time. You know, we sit there eating edamame beans before we go on air. <laughs> I did last night. And we just, yeah, they're quite nice, aren't they? He introduced me to them, actually, with a lot of salt. Very nice. Um, but, no. Get some chilli salt. Oh, yes. Yes. Although I don't want to be streaming. When, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't want to be streaming on air, though. Um, but he, um, he's good, Robbie. And I think it would be very easy for him he's had a professional playing career and I'm a girl that just rocks up and does radio and little bits of TV. So but he treats me like his equal and I have conversations with him where I can tell he, he really cares. He cares about other people. He cares about things a lot. And I think that's nice. And I think more people should know that probably about him, that he, he just care. He really does care. Do you really believe that you been fortunate to get where you are like you just described it as I've just rocked up and he's been doing it for ages uh, but he treats me as all equal I I know I've worked hard I do and all my friends and family say how hard I've worked but there are also a load of other people out there who've worked really hard and so I go I, I do think I feel very fortunate whether you know I think everybody it's human nature to say I should have worked harder or I could have done this or I should have done that or I should have done that I do think, I know I work hard, but I count my blessings because you can work hard all your life and not get the opportunities that I've got. So I feel really lucky in that respect. Do you not think that you deserve them? And do you not think that you're good at what you do? 
uh, I spent a long time, I spent a long, long time plagued with like self-doubt. And I think our industry is full of talented people. It really is. And it's, it's easy to look around and compare yourself and go, well, they're really good at this and they're really good at that. And they're far better than, at me than that. And this last year, um, I've really had, again, to look at myself and I've worked on that, on kind of believing in myself and reminding myself that I wouldn't be doing what I was doing if I was completely rubbish. So <laughs> there's some something there somewhere. Um, but I also think that's kind of OK to feel, you know, to feel that way sometimes, because I think that's going to. I'm so grateful and I think that that is one of the reasons why I'm so grateful and it in a, keeps you pushing keeps you pushing yourself and move, moving forward are there presenters you aspire to be like or or learn off um there are presenters that I've admired that I've grown up admiring that I admire now but I'm also of the belief that if you aspire to be like someone, you will find yourself comparing yourself to them and you will never be that person. So I try and steer clear of that because I don't think, um, it, you know, in, in the world, that there doesn't have to be two of everyone. You don't have to be like a person. You don't have to have the same presenting style as a person. You can admire them for what you do. You know, I admire you for what you do. We are totally different, yes. but I admire your work. Um, not all of it, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I admire. You over? Yeah. <laughs> Emma Jones blocked. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's it's kind of, and it's not just um, it's not just in sport that I admire presenters either. I think presenting is one of the the one of the most difficult things about it is being yourself whilst having to think about a million and one other things and hold things together. And there are presenters everywhere who are well-known, lesser well-known, who I watch doing it. And I go, you're brilliant. You are brilliant at doing that because you feel relaxed watching them. Well, I think you are brilliant at what you do. And I think you should be incredibly proud of your journey. You. Uh, you, you've proved that you've worked hard uh, you've focused on where you wanted to be. You focused on your goals. You have progressed. You've stood up every single opportunity. Stood up and been counted at every single opportunity you've had. And you know, I, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that might look at you and judge you. But I wish and I hope that they judge you for who you are, what you're doing, because you're doing an amazing job right now. No doubt about it. The future is bright. It really oh, is. Thank you. Get me emotional there, James. <laughs> Thank you. Um, your, your turn now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're, you're all right too. So. <laughs> I'll take that. That's all right. <laughs> oh, no, seriously. Thank you. Though. My head won't fit out the door at the end of isolation. <laughs> After that. Thank you. But don't stop working hard. No, keep grafting. Keep grafting. Keep grafting. Is it, what advice would you give somebody who's an up and coming presenter, wants to make it in the industry? Be yourself. Because you'll end up wherever you're supposed to be. So don't fake who you are. Um, don't change around certain people. Treat everybody as you meet them. If there's one thing I have seen, it's that genuine people come through. Like, you should treat... Don't, don't treat somebody better because you think they can do something for you. Remember that... Just be true to who you are. Treat everybody with exactly the same respect. Because, you know just because somebody can't serve you doesn't mean they're not important in the workplace everybody is just as important and I have been that person who's not been able to serve people and I've seen people treat people differently and it's horrible to watch and it's not nice and you aren't going to feel good if you do that so be yourself be kind to everyone and accept that you will never know everything you are going to have to keep learning because particularly in our game it's ever changing so you've got to have to keep learning. I think that is wonderful, wonderful advice. I really do. And it's something I believe in completely. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly not established enough yet. And I've got my own goals where I want to be. But I tell you what, I will continue to learn. Uh, I studied journalism five years ago because I wanted something extra to go alongside my presenting. I read, I research. And these are the stuff you've got to do. And I think that advice is absolutely spot on as well. I really do. The other thing I would say is help other people. It doesn't have to be dog eat dog. It help other people. You know, remember who you were. Remember when you were, you know, like you say, like five years ago, 
what you'd give for some advice like give people time just give people your time do you do you ever feel like it's a doggy dog world have you ever experienced that where you've got like a bit of competition with maybe another presenter I, I'm going to be honest. I think, again, that could be one so. of my downfalls. Put him. I hope so. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a big fat lie. No. I, I'm I, going to lie to you right now. <laughs> I'm probably, um, probably not competitive enough. I, I love seeing other people do well and I root for other people. And I'm not the kind of person who I don't see people as threats because it comes back to that thing of if you be yourself you'll end up where you're supposed to be and like if if for example if someone takes your job then there's another job or there's another another avenue for you there's something else for you and it was their time that's like my attitude towards it I, I can understand why people it is a doggy dog world in as much as you know there can be insecurity because um there's only a finite amount of jobs and there's a lot of people wanting them and everyone's got bills to pay etc but I just think Again, you know, just be genuine, be yourself, be kind to others. And everybody in, in this industry is going to have a hit and a knock. I've had so many rejections, so many rejections. And I'm so grateful for them. That sounds so cliche. But they've taught me so much. They've taught me that actually that wasn't the path for me. And I'm glad that that happened. So you can't be bitter because it doesn't serve you at all. How do you cope with rejection? Um, initially, I remember um, in what year was it? We went away on a girl's holiday and I'd, I'd um, been for the worst job interview of my life before, but really wanted this job, even though I knew at the time I was terrible. Um, and my mate had also been for uh, a job interview to be an air steward, an air stewardess. And uh, when we were on holiday, she got the email to say she got the job and I got the email to say I'd been rejected. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going to lie, like, we were all celebrating her obviously but there was a small part of me that was like I'm really gutted about that don't get me wrong we were getting ready to go out on a night out so that lasted all of 10 to 10 minutes and then I was like I'm going out with my mates I'm on holiday I'm here to have a good time um but as it as I've progressed and got got older and done more stuff I've realized that the reason for rejection is because I'm just not the right person for it and that's all right there's something that, that I am right for and it's not a it's not a it's easy to take it personal, but it's not a slight on me. It's just that I am not what that person wants to fill that role, and that's okay. You move on and dust yourself off, ask for feedback, and move on. 100%. I'm sitting there again nodding at you. Yeah. <laughs> you like church of the nodding dog? <laughs> I like nodding dog, honestly. My dad's called me that before. He's critiqued me before, and I've been on a, I did a golf show on Sky Sports uh, a couple of years ago, and, uh, and he said, I watched just one thing. You nod a lot when I'm talking. I'm like, crap, do I? And now I'm watching it back and I'm... Do you know what? If you're going to get some constructive criticism, you might as well get it from your dad, eh? Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, well, I'm interested in what he's saying. So I'm not... and, then, and also it shows that you're just being yourself. Because if you were trying to hold your head dead still, then you wouldn't be being yourself. I'll try that next time. Yeah. The problem is I'll try that and then you'll you'll be talking away and, and you'll be going, you're yeah. not interested, is he? Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you just fall asleep as well? <laughs> is the screen frozen or just... I think that's another that's something you touched on there though, is like as presenters, we really over analyze ourselves on camera. Everything. We 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 notice so you probably maybe you do nod a lot, but you will nod in your mind a lot more than you actually do. Here he goes. <laughs> um, and it, for me, it's certain things that I say and it really annoys me. So I try and stop myself from saying it, but I just say it again. And it, it probably doesn't matter so much to other people, but it's we are our own worst critic. 100%. But I feel like you have to be because it's not like, um, because we do, you know, we're freelance and we work for different companies and, you don't necessarily get feedback. No. You don't. If, more, more often than not, you, the only time you get feedback is when you've done something wrong. Yeah. Um, and the way I see it, if I haven't heard anything, then, good. okay, it's all good right now. Um, but that's why we rely on ourselves for our, for our own feedback. And we have to watch out for our performances. And 
you know, I know some people think, oh, it's only presenting, you're doing this, but there's so many different aspects and parts of it. And if we notice, yeah, we're repeating the same word that we keep on saying, whether it's like a, a basically, or, yeah. um, well, you know what, or, or, do you know, those sort of common words that people, yeah. or it's your mannerisms like me. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it might be, we're critiquing. We, we are quite harsh on ourselves at times. Mm. I don't think I could read anything about myself that I haven't said to myself already. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. But right. it's good to be self aware anyway, isn't to, it? And you have to learn. And that's how you learn from it. And that's how you learn from each job you do. That, okay, I'll listen back to that radio show. Right. What did I say? Oh, yeah, I didn't say that particularly right. Well, I need yeah. to work on how I pronounce that or say those words in a better sentence and a better order yeah. to come across better. Um, yeah, yeah, we're always learning. Absolutely. And, and you have to always learn. Absolutely. You're obsessed with uh, Biscoff biscuits. Yes, they are the best thing in the world. So I, I love the biscuit. In fact, when I go to the hairdressers, that's the thing I'm most excited about. She has slightly bigger than normal Biscoff biscuits. She must get them from like a wholesaler or something. I love Biscoff paste, the crunchy and the smooth, but the crunchy is a bit better. And they've just released um, a Biscoff biscuit with cream in the middle that I'm yet to find. So if anybody watches this and knows the supermarkets that are selling them, can you please tell me because I am desperate to find them. You're looking at me, James, like <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like Oliver Twist. I'm just, I'm just because I asked you this before last week and you know when you ask someone a question the second time round, you think oh, I'm probably going to be less enthusiastic you're just as enthusiastic about it as you were the first time this is that, real. I talk about it every day so you know there's a lot in that isn't there I'm used to talking about Biscoff biscuits to be fair people are like are you sponsored by them I'm like no but that would be the dream can you imagine just getting an endless supply of Biscoff Oh, I'd be rolling out of isolation. Uh, what are your top three biscuits? Um, Biscoff obviously is number one. Um, I like a I like a solid biscuit for a dunk. So like I'd like a chocolate digestive, a good quality chocolate digestive, and I also like um, a chocolate chip cookie, but not like I like Maryland cookies, but they're quite small. I like the big chunky ones. Like sometimes for a treat. I'll get those um, six packets from M&S that you can get. Oh, they are special. Some of them have nuts in them as well. Like, oh, the texture is incredible. I'm salivating slightly just thinking about it. So, yeah, those are my top three. What about you? Uh, chocolate digestives, definitely. But as a cookie, white chocolate. Anything oh. with chocolate, just... Oh. oh, they're so good, aren't they? You make me hungry. <laughs> so I was thinking, uh, before we did a uh, Biscuit World Cup, I'm not going to do that now. I'm just going to just literally just throw out some biscuits to you and we'll both just go... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm game for that. I'm, right. I'm, I'm so, chocolate fingers, white chocolate fingers. They are incredible. <laughs> do you know the only downside of them? They aren't big enough. You have to go in three at a time to get them... Three... <laughs> Three boxes at a time. Three, oh, yeah. Smash it. No, but you have to get three fingers. And how, but how I do it with the white chocolate ones is you put two at the bottom and one on top. So it's like a triangular shape going in and then crunch oh, the three oh, of them. Nice. Not tried it. Nice. No, no, I always multiple as well. Never, never just one. No, it's, just, three. it's not substantial, is it? Just the one. It's but not. Like with all biscuits, they've probably shrunk over the last 10, 20 years. So, you know, That's we're only eating one, really. That's my excuse for drink for eating the whole box. <laughs> Before it used to be half a box. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right now. That is so true. Right, la last biscuit, I'm going to throw you away. Uh, Choco Lightnings with the chocolate and the little biscuit underneath and the white chocolate version of them. Oh, don't even. So that biscuit reminds me of holiday. They are a holiday biscuit. To They're me. a European biscuit. Yeah. Yeah, you can get them over here and I love them. What I like to do with them is, oh my God, they're so exciting because they've got obviously the little rim around the end where the chocolate hangs off. So I like to nibble that all the way around and build up, build up to the good stuff in the middle. So like, you know that you get, you're like, oh, this is good. I'm getting the thin bits around the edges and then you get the dense bit in the middle and you go in on that crunch. And what, what they've got really, really, what they've done really well is um, the chocolate to biscuit ratio is near on perfect. There is neither one that's too thick. Honestly, 
really, I don't know if you can tell, James, but very passionate about biscuits. I hope everyone knows we were talking about biscuits there because yeah. we've been missing <laughs> something completely different at one point. There. I, 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 out of context, <laughs> out of context, biscuit chat. Out of context, I, I think that went to a whole new context level. <laughs> um, we love biscuits. Uh, yeah, because you make me hungry. Uh, and otherwise, I'll have to put like an 18 sign in the corner. Yes. <laughs> that was def definite biscuit porn. Yes. Uh, Emma, any final thoughts before we do it again for a third time? I know, yeah. The, my, my first thought is that I really hope I've not had my back to you for the whole of this interview. <laughs> you have been looking at the gardener again a little bit at time. Oh, God damn not it. That much. Not that much, you're right. <laughs> Um, my second thought is that I've got a packet of biscoff in my cupboard that um, I, I'm going to go and devour. I don't blame you. I don't. <laughs> uh, Emma, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, everyone's going to have a fantastic time watching this, I'm sure, and they really get to know the real you. Uh, like I said, you're a top girl. You're incredibly talented, and the future is certainly bright. Thanks very much, James. I know you've had three hours sleep, so I'm going to let you go and have a big nap. I have. I will do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no thank you thank you so much i've genuinely really enjoyed it so thank you great i'll see you again soon thank you see you tomorrow <laughs> thanks james